Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of this evening. We thank you for this wonderful book that we have the privilege of studying. Lord, we pray that you would help us to set aside all of the things that we have been worried about or preoccupied with during the day, and that instead we would be able to enter into the story, that we'd be able to enter into the scriptures that we're going to look at, and that you would use this time as we get ready to enter into Holy Week to prepare our hearts for the wonder of understanding your love at an even deeper level. We thank you for this time and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I am delighted to see all of y'all here tonight. Uh, a word of welcome to anybody that's new in person or online. And as always, we're going to start with the name that tune. Uh, I have to say I was very disappointed last time because Coldplay is one of the great musical groups of the past 50 years, and no one really got that. But that's okay. So I'm pitching you, if this were softball, this would be a bunt tonight. So I expect someone to know what this is. No pressure, though. It's not cold play. Yes, Jock Stender right off the bat. All things bright and beautiful. Extra credit if you know who's the arranger of this particular. Yes, Jane, good job, John Rutter. All right, so that was good. Uh, there is a reason that I picked that music, so we will uh, talk about that later on. I commend to you when the email comes out, listen to that all the way through. It is absolutely beautiful. So as usual, let's start by saying our scripture verse together. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And there are so many ways that this verse relates to this book, but particularly this idea that people will not put up with sound doctrine and they will want what their ears want to hear. And if you don't give it to them, they'll go find somebody that will. So uh, if you are new, a word of welcome and just a word about how to approach this class. Uh, you can be on the beach, which means that you don't do anything. You might not even come. Uh, you, you listen to it occasionally, you think about it from time to time, and then it just goes away. And if that's all you want to do, I'm delighted to have you. You are most welcome. Or you can snorkel, which means that you are going into the parts that you find interesting. There are two really great handouts tonight. And if you are snorkeling and you like what we're talking about in class tonight, then you can read those handouts and they will bless you. But if you're on the beach, you don't even have to pick them up or you can make them into a paper airplane. <laughs> or if you are scuba diving, you can go deep with everything. You can go home and wait with bated breath for the email to come, and you can look up John Rutter's biography and Cecil Francis Alexander's biography and learn everything there is to know about all things bright and beautiful and everything else that will be in the email. However you want to do it is great with me. Uh, the one thing I do want to encourage you, especially if you are um, a new listener online, uh, whether you are, we have such a reach from Wadmalaw Island to people in New Brunswick that are new this week. 
Um, wherever you are, if you're not on the email list, please Google St. Phelps Church Charleston and send me a note and I'll get you added to that so you get these resources. So uh, we are still in chapter 11, not bankruptcy, uh, but chapter 11 of the great divorce. And I make no apology for the fact that this is the third class on this chapter uh, because there's a lot of really great stuff in here. Um, and I'm gonna go through this review really, really quickly. You'll remember the part of the chapter that we just read. There's the young man who's got this lizard on his shoulder that's whispering in his ear all the time. And he says, I can't come into the heavenly country, into that far green land, because this lizard is so rude and inappropriate. He is like those warnings that you get on TV, um, MA, language, violence, sex, all of that. The lizard is all those things, and the guy's like, I can't go into heaven with this thing on. So the bright spirit, the angel that's there is like, may I kill it? And the guy's like, whoa, I just want to tame the lizard. And the angel's like, no, 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 may I kill it? And the guy's like, well, no, and, you know, he'll be good, he'll be good. May I kill it? Seven times, may I kill it? And ultimately, the guy says yes, and this incredible transformation happens in the this ghostly person is turned into this beautiful, magnificent, bright spirit, and the lizard changes from a nasty, ugly lizard into the most beautiful stallion, and they ride off onto the top of the far green mountain. It is amazing. Uh, but anyway, themes in this chapter. First, sin attaches itself to us, just like that lizard on the shoulder. It's always whispering at us. And one of the things that scripture tells us is that we have to realize that sin clings so closely and we have to lay it aside. It's like trying to run a race, going out to run a race in your track meet where you're doing the 100-yard dash and you've got like barbells tied to your feet. That's just stupid. Why would you do that? But we try to live life with the sin attached to us. The other thing is that sin cannot be managed. It must be put to death. As the scripture says in Colossians, just like the bright spirit, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And I hesitate to say this next verse out loud because when I preached on this later that day is when all my eye problems started. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Yeah, so I don't know what that was about. And then the day after I had the surgery that fixed all this, the lesson was on the blind man that received his sight. So there's something going on up there. Thirdly, sin cannot be defeated by a gradual process. This is not like Weight Watchers weight loss program. It is not gradual, it is an all or nothing, you cut it out, um, you are unable on your own to structure your life in such a way to rid it of sin. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to be at work to do that. Excuses for sin cannot bear their own weight. And the problem with this is that we all go right back to what happened in Genesis 3 and God is looking for Adam and Eve. Where are you? Of course, he knows where they are. Um, but they're hiding. And as they hide, uh, they are very aware of their guilt. And what happens is God says, what is this that you have done? And the woman says, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And then God looks at Adam. And Adam he makes Eve look pretty good by what he says. Adam says, the woman that you gave me, she made me eat it. Force fed him, apparently. Uh, but the point is that it's really God's fault. God's the one that gave him that particular woman, and he should have gotten him a different one. Because if it had been a different woman, maybe it wouldn't have happened this way. That's the way humans are. We always try to blame someone and make an excuse. Fifth, eliminating sin will hurt. We live in an age that is syncretistic in 
every way, and we just want to have everything. We don't want to think that we have to give up anything or cut out anything. It reminds me of, uh, how many of you have ever seen that old movie, Bruce Almighty? If you've never watched it, do yourself a favor and watch it. It makes some very good points, but one of the things in there is that people are trying to get God to just sort of do what they want him to do, and Bruce is God for a little while, and so there's this one line where there's this woman who's a little, just we'll say, pleasingly plump. How about that? Um, and she, her throwaway line is, I just lost 50 pounds on the Krispy Kreme diet. And that's the way we like to think about dieting or eliminating anything that's harmful like sin, that it's just going to be fine. We can eat Krispy Kreme all day and lose weight. It's going to be great. But the problem is that eliminating sin actually hurts. It requires sacrifice. Six, God will not intervene against our will, and sin will try to seduce us. And remember, when the guy is right about at the point of saying, okay, go ahead and kill the lizard, the lizard starts chattering. Be careful. He can kill me. Then you'll be without me forever and ever. You'd be only a sort of ghost, not a real man. And I'll be so good. I'll admit, I've gone too far in the past, but I promise I won't do it again. That's the way sin is. It chatters at us and wants to seduce us. Seven, God wants to free us from slavery to sin that steals our joy. And this is very much like that quotation uh, that Ken Boa, if you were here on Sunday, used, where Lewis is talking and says, God does not find our desires too strong, but too weak. We are like children living in a slum who would much rather play all day with mud pies because they cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the seashore. We are far too easily pleased. And the fact of the matter is God wants to give us joy, not just what the sin gives, which is momentary pleasure. So uh, that was a, oh, there's still one more. Yes, when loves are rightly ordered, there's healing and joy. We did a little dive into St. Augustine, and I just have to say, those of you, you know who you are, who went out after I talked about City of God and ordered it and are starting trying to read that, I say bravo to you. Most people, when you see a 700-page book, they send it back to Amazon. But there are some people in this class that are, that are starting in to read City of God. That is a beautiful thing. But the remarkable thing about what Augustine is saying is that it derives right out of the summary of the law that we say in church every week, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, Love your neighbor as yourself. And when you do things in that order, when loves are rightly ordered, then beauty and joy and healing result. So uh, we said there was a little word from mere Christianity about the last two ghosts. Remember Pam, who's so desperate to see her son Michael, and then this lizard. And Lewis, one of the things about Lewis is he always is talking about the same things. When you read his books, the little things show up in different places. So this is very much what he's talking about with this analogy about the piano. Now, I really like this. If this analogy does nothing for you, just let it go right over your head and don't worry about it. But he says, strictly speaking, there are no such things as good and bad impulses. Think once again of a piano. It has not got two kinds of notes on it, the right notes and the wrong ones. Every single note is right at one time and wrong at another. The moral law is not any one instinct or set of instincts. It's something which makes a kind of tune, the tune we call goodness or right conduct, by directing the instincts. It's like the sheet music that you read in order to produce a beautiful melody and harmony. But our problem is that we're sort of like a small puppy walking across a keyboard. Uh, we don't pay any attention, and it results in a cacophony of noise. 
All right, so that brings us finally to part three of chapter 11, which we are actually going to finish tonight. You'll be happy to know. Um, and there are several interesting things that happen in the end of this chapter. And basically what happens, remember, we've just seen this new bright spirit created, this magnificent spirit of this ghost has been transformed into this golden, glowing, strong, shining angel. And then he mounts this beautiful stallion and rides off not into the sunset, but up the mountain that is part of the far green country, the high heavenly places where the spirit of God is drawing all these bright spirits. And so as they go up, um, Lewis, remember, is the narrator here, and George MacDonald is his guide, and then they have a little conversation about what's going on. But before their conversation, something very strange happens, which is the earth itself starts singing. The far green land that they're on the ground starts singing, and the forces of nature start singing and blessing God. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then Lewis and MacDonald have their conversation. So the first passage, the creation rejoices. I came out to follow them, that is the horse and the bright spirit, with my eyes. But already they were only like a shooting star, far off on the green plain, and soon among the foothills of the mountains. Then, still like a star, I saw them winding up till near the dim brow of the landscape, so high that I must strain my neck to see them. They vanished, bright themselves, into the rose brightness of that everlasting morning. The whole plain and forest were shaking with a sound which in our world would be too large to hear, but there I could take it with joy. I knew it was not the solid people who were singing, it was the voice of that earth, those woods, and those waters. A strange, archaic, inorganic noise that came from all directions at once. We're going to unpack that in a minute. And then, obedient fire. The nature or arch nature of that land rejoiced to have been once more ridden and therefore consummated in the person of the horse, it sang, the master, that is God, says to our master, come up, share my rest and splendor till all natures that were your enemies become slaves to dance before you and backs for you to ride and the firmness for your feet to rest on. From beyond all place and time, out of the very place authority will be given you. The strengths that once opposed your will shall be obedient fire in your blood and heavenly thunder in your voice. Overcome us that so overcome we may be ourselves. We desire the beginning of your reign as we desire dawn and dew, wetness at the birth of light. And what he's talking about here is when our loves are rightly ordered, and all of the passions and appetites that God has built into us are put in their right relation to love and worship, that there is glory that results from that, and we become the fullness of what it means to be made in the image of God. So the third thing, being raised to heaven first requires death. Now you might have noticed last time, may I kill it? May I kill it? May I kill it? May I kill it? It's not an accident that that happens seven times. And we are, as a culture, really uncomfortable with the idea of death. We don't like to think about our mortality. We don't like the thought of putting to death any part of ourselves because that seems somehow not authentic. But being raised to heaven, remember, Heaven is the dwelling place of God, the fullness of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that life-giving fountain of being from all eternity that is spreading forth in the heavenly realms. And God, before anything else, is holy. Holiness means you cannot be in the presence of sin. Sin cannot enter in 
to heaven. So everything that is earthly has to be put to death so that it can be resurrected to come into that new life of heaven. So this is Lewis asking a question. Am I right in thinking the lizard really turned into the horse? George MacDonald. Aye, but it was killed first. But does it mean that everything that is in us can go to the mountains? Nothing, not even the best and noblest, can go on as it is now. Nothing, not even what is lowest and most bestial, will not be raised again if it submits to death. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Flesh and blood cannot come to the mountains, not because they are too rank, but because they are too weak. It's not an accident that the ghosts are see-through, and the bright spirits are also called solid people. Flesh and blood cannot come to the mountains, not because they're too rank, but because they are too weak. What is a lizard compared with a stallion? Lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing compared with that richness and energy of desire which will arise when lust has been killed. And then the glory of risen love. So Lewis asking a question again. But am I to tell them at home that this man's sensuality proved less of an obstacle than that poor woman's love for her son? For that was at any rate an excess of love. And part of what Lewis is getting at here is it's so easy and the church has so often been obsessed with sexual sin as like the worst thing. Like, ooh, don't do that. Or it could be like that little sign that's on Justin's door that I'm still trying to figure out who gave him this. And it's a little silhouette of Jesus that sits on the corner and then down the side it says, I saw that. <laughs> but the problem is that a failure to love properly, when you look at what scripture tells us, is far worse than a sexual failure. And George MacDonald is going to be very quick to talk to Lewis about saying that this poor woman, this poor, poor loving mother, mother love and apple pie, how could you be against her? So sad. But George MacDonald is not going to buy it. He says, you'll tell them no such thing, he replied sternly. Excess of love, did you say? There was no excess. There was defect. She loved her son too little, not too much. If she'd loved him more, there'd be no difficulty. But it may well be that at this moment she's demanding to have him down with her in hell. That kind is sometimes perfectly ready to plunge the soul they say they love into endless misery if only they can still in some fashion possess it. No, no. You must draw another lesson. You must ask if the risen body, even of an appetite, is as grand a horse as you saw, what would the risen body of true maternal love or friendship be? And what Lewis is trying to tell us here is that the loves that are the God-ordained loves that are rightly ordered, that when they come into their fullness, and the heavenly places are going to be so full of joy and wonder that they are beyond our imagining. So, that brings us to looking at these themes with some scripture. So that first one about the creation rejoicing. The whole plain and forest were shaking with the sound which in our world would be too large to hear, but there I could take it with joy. Notice that Lewis is becoming more of a solid person. You might remember way back early on, he was terrified even of the raindrops that were falling because he was so thin. But his, he has expanded, and now this joy that is pulsing and singing out of the earth, he can experience. I f- knew it was not the solid people who were singing, It was the voice of that earth, those woods and those waters, a strange, archaic, inorganic noise that came from all directions at once. So 
This is a topic that I think we don't think about enough. The whole idea of heaven rejoicing or the earth rejoicing. And the scriptures are full of that language, but we don't ever really think about, well, what does that mean? And we usually just sort of skip over it. But listen to some of these verses. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And in case you missed it, we just saw joy in heaven over a sinner who repents with the man and the lizard. And then in Romans 8, this is, we could spend all night on this verse, but I'm not going to. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And then one of those great passages from Isaiah, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all of the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And I would like to suggest that if we would embrace and just dwell for a minute in this concept, it can change our lives. And um, we're going to do a little bit of an excursion here for a moment. And I see I dropped my quotation on the floor. Um, one of the things about this that I think is so significant is that when you read in the church fathers and early theologians, very often you will see a statement, something along these lines, that God has revealed himself to us first and foremost through Jesus Christ, but he has also revealed himself to us through three testaments. And you may think, three testaments? The Old Testament, the New Testament, the Third Testament is the creation. And that God reveals himself to us in the creation. And in previous ages, people understood this, but we have totally, totally lost that concept to our detriment. And Lewis really believed strongly in what we could learn um, about God and about heaven from studying the creation. And we've talked before about how Lewis was a medievalist and he loved the medieval cosmology. And again, Ken Boa, when he was here this weekend, talked about that uh, and the whole idea that in the medieval world, there are the seven heavens and earth is in the center of things. But there was this whole idea of beauty and order in the vault of heaven. And Lewis described this medieval cosmos, that way of seeing not only the solar system, but this earth as tingling with anthropomorphic life, dancing, ceremonial, a festival, not a machine, an organic whole ordered from within, animated by a hierarchy of souls. And the commentator says it meant that nature possessed a sacred and spiritual value by virtue of its creation by God and the eminent presence of God within it. The world was a book pregnant with meanings that God had placed there. All things were God's creatures. The stars and planets in particular were angels, creatures participating in their own way in the cosmic intelligence, their movements, high dance. And I think that whole concept of the sacredness of creation being made by God, that everything that grows, that has life, is made by God, in those moments that we see of beauty and sunset and sunrise, the ocean, the rhythm of the waves, the feel of the breeze, all of that is made by God. It's not an accident. And we've just totally lost that. And it's interesting, um, if you've never studied the book of Job, I would encourage you to do that. It's something a lot of people are sort of afraid to study uh, because it 
a lot of it is a lot of complaining, uh, which most of us have enough of that in our life already. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there's a profound theological point in Job. And the point is that there are all these questions that are asked to God, and God doesn't really answer them. God's response to all this questioning is to reveal more about who he is and to show Job that his concept of God is far too small. It's like as we've talked about Flat Stanley before, that he was seeing God as more of a Flat Stanley instead of the beautiful, amazing fountain in the center of the universe. Um, this passage from Job, when God begins his reply, is just beautiful. Where were you? When I laid the foundation of the earth, tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's in the Bible we just don't think about that. When you go out tonight, if you look up, especially if you've got binoculars at home, look at the moon and look at the five planets brightly shining in a row right next to the moon. It's unbelievable. And this whole idea of creation singing is embedded in the word of God. Um, Habakkuk. I love the book Habakkuk, which is sort of a strange book to love. Um, but when Jane and I were in college, when we were in InterVarsity, they had a multimedia company that was doing gospel presentations, and they did this incredible multimedia presentation on Habakkuk that I don't know if it's out there anywhere, but it will blow your mind if you watch this thing. But it developed to me a great affection for this book. And in the end of the book, you hear, God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, his splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. And we have such an anemic idea of God. Y'all are probably too young to know what I mean by this, but we think of God as like Casper the Friendly Ghost. And... If you don't know who that is, go on YouTube and look up the old cartoon, Casper the Friendly Ghost, that we think God is just sort of this white presence that sort of flits around out there. But that's not what Habakkuk is talking about. This is God coming in with power and glory and beauty and the earth raising up and singing praise as he comes. Psalm 96, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. There's that singing thing again. Uh, this is all through scripture. These are just a couple of examples. And we need to get back in touch with this idea. And we've talked before how many similarities there are between the great divorce and Dante's divine comedy. And in Dante, um, in the Purgatorio part, the earth shakes and a psalm of praise is sung every time a soul is released from purgatory um, and there's an earthquake that celebrates that. And the singing accompanies each advance that happens. So this whole thing of when the bright spirit newly created gets on the horse and rides up this mountain and the land is singing and the trees are singing and the water is singing and there is glory and it's so full that Lewis can only hear it because his ears have begun to get accustomed to this heavenly land. He's trying to make a point here that our understanding of heaven is way too anemic.
but not just that, that our understanding of the firmament, the terrestrial firmament, is too weak. We are not just wandering around on some neutral piece of ground. We are wandering around in a creation that is charged with the glory of God. And we are so busy staring into our iPhone that we don't even notice. It is just pitiful. And I'm as bad as any of the rest of us about this. But I would encourage you to develop the habit of contemplation of beauty. Even if it's just looking at some leaves on a shrub. If you just look at those leaves and think about the fact that those leaves came out of nowhere. At one point, that shrub was not there. And somehow, there is a cosmic intelligence that enables growth and color and texture and all of that to spring up out of nothing. And God inhabits all of that. It is not an accident that that theophany with Moses in the desert, God appears to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And it's Elizabeth Barrett Browning who says, every bush is a burning bush if we would but see it. And Lewis is one of the people, Lewis and Tolkien, really embrace this idea. If you read Narnia, if you read The Lord of the Rings, the trees are anthropomorphized, which is a fancy word for saying made like humans. They speak, they have feelings, they express themselves. You see them dancing. You see them singing for joy. And Lewis didn't make that up, nor did Tolkien. They got it out of the scriptures. And when we read that, our hearts rejoice in it because we long for that kind of creation. And both Lewis and Tolkien talk about how the trees have gone to sleep because the humans who tend them have forgotten that they were made in that way. Probably the most beautiful part of this idea is expressed in Narnia in the creation story that you find in The Magician's Nephew. And I'm gonna do something very dangerous at five till eight. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. Close your eyes and just listen as I read this narrative. I'll tell you when to open them. Hush, said the, well, let me set the scene first. You can open your eyes. Um, so the scene that's happened is that wicked Uncle Andrew, who is a perverse magician, has been fooling around with trying to make some magical rings. And he's discovered a way of getting into other countries and other times. And so as he does that, um, he has sent Polly and Diggory, his nephew and her friend, or his friend, back into another world which is ruled by an evil queen. That's not what you want your uncle to be doing. So they've gone back to this world with the evil queen. Well, they've accidentally brought the evil queen out of this land, and it's really bad, and they bring the evil queen back into London, and she goes on a rampage in London and beats up people. She pulls a lamppost out of the ground and is thrashing people with it, and then she gets onto a horse-drawn cab, and they finally realize this is really bad. We're going to, like, kill people. And so one of the children um, puts the ring on that draws them into a new land that's just being created which we're going to find out is Narnia, but we don't know. They, so they just come into this land, and everything is dark, and they don't know where they are, and they're terrified. And so they've been sitting and arguing, and then all of a sudden, something happens. Now you can close your eyes. Hush, said the cabbie. They all listened. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth itself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune. But it was beyond comparison the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. God, said the cabbie, 
Ain't it lovely? Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment, there had been nothing but darkness. Next moment, a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out, single stars, constellations, and planets brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds. The new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen and heard it, as Diggory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves who were singing, and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. Glory be, said the cabbie, I'd have been a better man all my life if I had known there were things like this. You can open your eyes. What Lewis is doing is painting a picture of what the scriptures are describing about the way the Spirit of God shaped the earth and shaped the beauty and the joy of that creative process. And as we read in Romans, creation has fallen along with us, but it will one day be redeemed. And when you look in Revelation 21 and read about the new heaven and the new earth and the beauty of those when they come down from heaven, uh, it will fire your soul. And if it doesn't, it will be like our old priest Ryan Street used to say, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. <laughs> so speaking of fire, obedient fire, that whole idea of these desires when they are put in their proper order, turning into something beautiful of rightly ordered loves. And that whole idea that when we put God first, when we seek him first, everything else then falls into a place that brings joy. From Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. And then that great verse from Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world. And a lot of that has to do with what you look at, where you put your eyes. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then Jesus in Matthew 10 Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's like that old quotation from Jim Elliot, the famous missionary who was martyred in Ecuador. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The cross, it's so crazy, as the gospel says and as Paul says, um, it's foolishness to the world, the idea that the cross is the gateway to eternal life, but it is the truth with a capital T. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? And then this, again, the idea that we have to put things to death in order to be raised to heaven. And the idea that nothing can go as it is now, even the best of us is still tainted with sin. And we have to be put to death. We have to do what Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. 
Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that when we go into that crucified life, which sounds in the world's eyes crazy, that is where glory and joy and everything else can break out. And Colossians is such a great book on this. Uh, if you haven't read Colossians 3 in a while, um, take some time and just read that chapter. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. And remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about that word seek. Uh, it's like Harry Potter and the seeker, absolutely focused on that snitch. Wherever that snitch is going, you're right behind it, getting ready to grab it. Seeking means you are fully engaged going after something. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. You have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. And notice this absolute distinction that Paul is making here between your life before when you were walking in these things and your life now because of what Christ has done for you and the fact that you need to change what you're seeking as a result. And then the glory of risen love. This whole idea that our true home, our true country is heaven. And I was so tempted to read the entire chapter of the last chapter of the last battle to you, but I had mercy on you, so I'm not going to do that. But that is all about the glory of risen love. So this is the whole idea that rightly ordered love, when it is set free from the bounds of sin, and takes root in the heavenly country in the presence of Christ, and we are drawn into that everlasting fountain of life and the Trinity, that Zoe life that is eternal, that when that happens, there is glory and joy that results. And one of the things that we see over and over again in Scripture is that Jesus is our example, that Jesus shows us how to love. Jesus shows us how to lay down our life Jesus shows us how to serve. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You desire, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. We are so limited. We are looking, we're seeking mud pies instead of the joy that is on offer. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And then from Revelation 21, he, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. 
It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Part of what Lewis is trying to tell us is that we have got to retrain ourselves to think on these things, to realize that we are living in a world that is made with beauty and enchantment, even though it has fallen. In the weight of glory, Lewis says, we are in need of the strongest spell possible to break the evil enchantment of materialism which has possessed our world. And there is a deep truth in that. And part of the reason that I love this hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, is it makes us stop and think about this. And Cecil Francis Alexander is a fascinating person to study. She was one of the great hymn writers of the 19th century and lived in Ireland and wrote so many amazing hymns, and no one knows anything about her today. But I would encourage you, if you're a scuba diver, nerd out and study a little bit about her because her life is an amazing testimony to what it means to follow Jesus. Um, say these words with me. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, he made their tiny wings. The purple-headed mountain, the river running by, the sunset and the morning that brightens up the sky, the cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in the garden, he made them every one. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell how great is God Almighty who has made all things well. And I guess the question for us, are our eyes seeing these things? Are we just blind to them? We need to open our eyes and we need to use our lips to tell the glory of God to other people. I want to conclude with this poem, and I'm going to ask you again to close your eyes, but Jared Manley, don't close them yet, Jared Manley Hopkins is one of the great Christian poets. Uh, if you don't know his work, I commend it to you. He is a poet who is made to be read out loud, not to be enjoyed in the silence of the library. So find yourself a good chair in a room where you won't disturb anyone and get some Jared Manley Hopkins poems and read them out loud, and it will bless you. He was a deeply Christian man and had uh, a, just a deep sense of all of what we've been talking about tonight. Um, so now you can close your eyes. This poem is called God's Grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness, like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge, and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we confess to you the poverty of our imagination and of our souls and our failure to see the wonders that you have placed all around us. Lord, we are so focused on ourselves and our problems 
rather than looking at the glory of who you are and the glory of the story that you have told us that is the true story that you will return with power and glory and that the new heaven and new earth perfected will come down from heaven and we will be drawn up into that glorious life of the Trinity where in that far green country, the land and the trees sing for joy. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts that we might understand these things and that we might live in them, that we might not be conformed to this world, but that we would be transformed and that as our eyes see, our lips would tell of your glory, that this broken and hurting culture might come to the joy of knowing you. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.